Our next session is Values in Foreign Policy. Krishnan Srinivasan discusses his book with Shugato Bose and Hari Vasudevan. Krishnan Srinivasan was a diplomat serving as ambassador in Libya, Zambia, Nigeria, Netherlands, and Bangladesh before appointments as Secretary, Foreign Secretary, and Commonwealth Deputy Secretary General. After retirement, he was a visiting fellow at Cambridge, Leiden, and Uppsala, apart from academic positions in India. He is the author of books on international relations and a regular columnist and book reviewer for national newspapers. Shugato Bose is the Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University and has served as Director of Graduate Studies in History at Harvard and as the founding director of Harvard South Asia Institute. Hari Vasudevan is a specialist in Russian and European history and Indo-Russian relations and a UGC Emeritus Professor at the Department of History, University of Calcutta. He is a former member of the Indian Council of Historical Research and his research interests are in the following areas democracy and development in India and Europe, global politics of Soviet communism, Indo-Russian relations, and contemporary world politics. If I may please request our very distinguished panelists to come up on stage. Do Dr. Dr. Krishnan Srinivasan, Dr. Shugato Bose, and Dr. Hari Vasudevan. Welcome, sirs. I'm going to make another quick announcement before we start the panel. It's no use waiting here for signatures, sirs. Please, if you can head to the festival bookstore. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much indeed for being here. Um, I know that you've uh, shared a part of your Saturday morning uh, with us, and I think uh, we deserve, uh, we, you deserve great uh, sympathy and praise for that, and uh, we're very, very grateful. I'm also uh, very privileged to share this platform with uh, two uh, most distinguished uh, public intellectuals, uh, Professor Shugata Bose and uh, Professor Hari Vasudev. And um, I must say that uh, on a Saturday morning, you might find that the question of values and foreign policy is a bit heavy going, but uh, we'll try and uh, make it as, uh, uh, as uh, light and um, as uh, accessible as possible. And um, I suppose we consider ourselves very lucky that we are sandwiched between Mr. Ruskin Bond and uh, Mr. Amitabh Ghosh. So uh, that's a bonus for everybody. Um, I'd like to begin perhaps by saying just a few words about the book, and then uh, we'll hear much more from uh, Shugato and, uh, and Hari. Um, as far as the book is concerned, it uh, came out uh, some nine months ago abroad and it was uh, republished in India um, three or so months ago. And uh, it is, according to some people, the first ever um, narrative of uh, uh, the values and interests of important countries in the world. So um, we've covered about uh, 12 countries in this process, from the USA in the West to Japan in our East, and uh, we've tried to examine um, how the balance of values and interests plays out in each of these countries. Um, as you know, uh, Palmerston, the Prime Minister of uh, Britain, in the middle of the 19th century said, we have no permanent friends, we have no permanent enemies, we have only permanent interests. But I'm sure my colleagues on the stage will agree with me that that is not the full story, because uh, there's the question of values also. And um, it's very important, I think, for us to know uh, what the values of a particular country is, are, um, 
when we seek to understand um, uh, what they do and what they don't do. And so um, we tried to go into this uh, in the book in some considerable detail. Now, for small and uh, weak countries, it's uh, really uh, quite easy for them to have a value system. Their value system basically is to survive. And, uh, and uh, that is not so for big and important players in world politics. Um, most of the important countries in the world profess a certain value system, a certain ethical basis on which they, on which they act. And the difficulty, of course, is uh, for this uh, uh, to, um, to be implemented is that it runs across um, the problems of contingencies, circumstances, the realities of international politics, and, uh, of course, uh, the values of other countries, uh, which may not be congruent with, uh, with the values of your own. But uh, every country, I think, um, um, tries, every important country tries to look back into the past to look for the foundations of its value system. Uh, if we take uh, the United States, for example, um, uh, they go back to the founding fathers, uh, the... Um, Declaration of Independence begins by saying we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident seems to suggest that these are universal truths and uh, universal values that uh, need to be protected and projected. In, the, in Europe, um, who also speak a very great deal about values, they go back uh, also a long way to the Magna Carta, to Cromwell's Revolution, to uh, the French Revolution, uh, the uprisings of 1948. So they have a, a basis of historical um, foundation uh, to promote uh, a value system, which they also consider to be universal. Now, the rest of the world uh, give far less publicity or trumpet. They, f they, f they give far less um, prominence to values. So is this a case of the West versus the rest? And this is an important question which we will be considering today. There are reasons, I think, uh, the book goes into that for why the rest of the world do not actually trumpet their values that much. Um, while some of these reasons are colonialism, of course, the, the fact that colonialism was an aberration of the values promoted by the West. Uh, there's the question of um, the individual uh, in contrast to the state and society, uh, Western values tended to be oriented towards emancipative liberalism, that is to say, with emphasis on the individual, whereas uh, the rest tended to give equal, if not more, importance to state sovereignty and uh, societal values. And um, then there's the question of secularism. Secularism, not as we use it in India, but secularism, in terms of a clear distinction between state policy and religion. In the West, um, uh, religion has been kept completely to one side and has really nothing to do with uh, state policy, um, whereas in the rest, um, they found their inspiration from deep philosophical, religious, uh, theological foundations. So this is a big difference as well. And lastly, there's the question of modernity. Uh, from this city, we had uh, Partha Chatterjee, who said uh, uh, in a very convincing way that uh, Asians are never um, uh, architects of modernity. They're only the recipients of modernity. And so we have uh, the distinction between a pre-modern rest and a post-modern West. And these are really fairly fundamental differences. So anyway, um, that's more or less what the book uh, contains. Um, uh, in a kind of snapshot, but I'd like now to um, uh, to ask uh, Shugato, uh, who has a great experience of uh, USA, where he's still uh, an eminent professor. Uh, Shugato, uh, under President Trump, we have uh, a strong assertion of America first. Uh, is this a value that goes way back to the founding fathers in America, or is it a new phenomenon that's going to perhaps be an American value for the future? 
what Trump is doing uh, at the level of both domestic policy and foreign policy uh, is a very new phenomenon. Uh, it certainly does not go back to the uh, era of the founding fathers of the United States of America. Now, any country fighting for independence uh, must uh, engage with uh, international affairs. And in the case of uh, late uh, 18th century America, uh, those who wanted to break away from Britain uh, naturally uh, forged relationships with France in the era of the Enlightenment. Now, uh, the French ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity uh, figure nowhere in Trump's conception of uh, world affairs. He is essentially a businessman, uh, and uh, the word that he likes to use is transactional. I will do something for you only if you do something for me. Uh, and that's the basis on which he is being impeached today. He told the Ukrainian president that, uh, you know, start negotiations against my political rival, Joe Biden, and uh, you will get some uh, military aid uh, to resist uh, Russian uh, aggression. Also, um, Trump seems to have uh, a great fondness uh, for uh, dictators. Just, just consider uh, the love letters, his word, that he likes to exchange uh, with the North Korean uh, ruler, Kim. Also, uh, you know, I see uh, in the foreword to your book, uh, written by Robert Kaplan, uh, that he says uh, uh, foreign policy is uh, often an extension of a country's domestic condition. Uh, Trump has taken that to extreme lengths. He seems to be obsessed with uh, trying to overturn every legacy of his immediate predecessor, Barack Obama. And that's why uh, he has uh, withdrawn the United States from the very enlightened, far-sighted uh, uh, the nuclear deal uh, that the United States and the European powers had reached with Iran. And this uh, has been utterly irresponsible, and professionals uh, in the US State Department are dismayed uh, uh, with uh, you know, what Trump has done uh, in that area, and they are also uh, are lamenting the fact that the State Department uh, is being destroyed uh, under, under Trump's presidency. So that would, in short, be my answer to your question about Donald Trump. I, I just want to add in a more general sense uh, that, uh, you know, of course, uh, there's always some kind of a fine balance that has to be struck between values and interests, uh, between uh, principles and power in the formulation of uh, foreign policy. Uh, but I would like to mention that, uh, you know, Asians uh, have uh, never um, simply thought about uh, cultural defense. Uh, the most enlightened of our thinkers simply wanted to question Europe's or the West's monopoly on universalism. Uh, and uh, they wanted to say that, you know, we also want to contribute to the shaping of a global future. Uh, and so, um, you know, we want to offer our version of universalism with a difference. Now, that is not a defense of Asian values in the sense that uh, the Singaporeans, uh, you know, articulated that concept in the 1990s, because that was simply inverting uh, what the Europeans had claimed before, that Asia is the uh, fount of all uh, virtue. But there were rather more sophisticated thinkers uh, and leaders of our independence struggle, or uh, poet philosophers like Tagore, uh, who believed that we can think of a uh, interconnected, interreferential Asia that might have something very creative to offer uh, 
in terms of thinking of a new ethical conception in international affairs. Uh, yes, that's uh, absolutely right. But may I, I just come back to Mr. Trump for a moment before we leave him uh, from this discussion. I, I, uh, Robert Kaplan, who you mentioned, has also said in his foreword to this book that um, um, if America ceases to promote um, um, free trade and democracy across the world, then it will cease to be a major power. Do you think this is what is happening now? You know, however powerful you might be, there is the need for at least a modicum of moral authority if you want to retain leadership in the world. That Trump is in danger of losing. I agree with Kaplan there. Um, and he perhaps has lost it already. Uh, Hari, if I might uh, ask you about Europe. Uh, Europe has uh, a very strong tradition of liberalism, uh, both uh, within Europe and in Europe's projection abroad. Uh, do you think now that this is under tremendous stress with the differences that have arisen between what one might call Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the latter seem to have a different code of values at the moment. They don't speak much about values to start with. Uh, the Europeans mainly uh, have values articulated by the Nordic countries, by France, but very rarely by Hungary or, uh, or uh, the Czechs. So uh, do you see this uh, becoming a fissure, a fracture in, European, in the European Union? Um. You know, I, I, I'll take this um, at two levels, uh, the, the question that you pose. I'll take it partially from, uh, from a kind of follow-up to the, to the last discussion, the discussion between you and that you initiated with Shugato. The sense that um, I don't think that uh, 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 any one particular value system is independent of, of, of history uh, beyond a certain point. And I think even in the case of the United States, uh, there have been very long periods when the United States has excluded itself from global precincts and has very, very uh, aggressively done so. And I think the 20s and the 30s, as you know, is uh, precisely such, such a time. Um, and uh, there is, therefore, in practically every country or in every region, uh, a diversity of tendencies. And kind of the global tendency which we see um, uh, enshrined in the, in the Obama uh, presidency and to a certain degree in deglobalization, the Clinton presidency, these reflect one aspect of a particular continuum which exists in the United States, but there are other continuums as well. And I think the same holds true somewhere of Europe. Uh, and, I, uh, and Europe, when, when it is dealt with as a whole, um, my own sense is that um, we have, uh, uh, both in, um, in uh, India and in parts of Asia, we have tended to homogenize Europe. And um, there is a, a sense that uh, there is one set of, there is one kind of discourse that, that Europe actually generates. And I have a feeling there is a good reason why in the 1990s this sense of a homogeneity was there simply because uh, the West dominated the East in Europe during the early stages of the uh, period of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the uh, end of the Soviet, and I think it was, a Soviet empire over Eastern Europe. Okay? You may say it was a benevolent empire. You may quarrel about these issues. But ultimately, if there is any one empire that the Soviet Union had, it was primarily in Eastern Europe. It actually used Eastern Europe for its benefits. So. Somewhere or another, um, we go back to a time when Eastern Europe was quiet. But you know, in actually engaging with values, in actually dealing with a country's internal and external policy, it's very, very important for Eastern Europe, for all the countries of Eastern Europe, to have guidelines through which they would engage with the integration with the EU. Now, at that particular time, I, you're dealing with a period of international relations they had to actually formulate terms on which this integration would actually take place, and the integration more globally of the EU within a globalization uh, paradigm. And there, 
they would actually have to think in terms of the way French, German, Italian, and other values, as articulated in the mid-20th century, would hold good for them. And here, I think, there came to be problems. In certain cases, as in the case of East Germany, there were no problems simply because East Germany's structures were practically liquidated by the West. But essentially, in Romania, or in Poland, or in, uh, in Hungary, this is not to be the case. You have very, very lively intellectual communities that are actually fought the good fight against the Soviet Union in its own time, and which actually looked to folk traditions and intellectual traditions of the 19th and early 20th century in which they had, I think, major things to offer. I mean, they engaged with the world during the interwar period on their own terms, independent of the Russian Empire, independent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the like. And somehow or another, they had a sense that they had something to contribute. The result was that they began, I think, during the uh, mid-2000s and, uh, mid, uh, and 2010s, to think beyond, say, a Visegrad paradigm in which they simply held together as a bunch of states, and think more in terms of a uh, set of paradigms in which their sovereignty would be more assertive in a lively manner. And that sovereignty is the challenge to the so-called European contribution to Western values. Um, the integrity of Western values, which somehow was there in the 1990s, has disintegrated precisely because after these countries joined the EU, they now need to work out the terms on which they are to actually become standard bearers of those values. Now, I, so I don't think it's a question of the EU folding up or the EU actually di uh, disintegrating or something. I think it is a, in a process of recreation and transition. But how it is to achieve that recreation and transition, I think very much as in the case of the failures of the uh, Obama and the, uh, and the uh, Clinton presidencies to give large sections of American con constituents a kind of reason and an investment in globalization, very much in that light, um, we are having a, we are going through a period in which the so-called Western European paradigm, the Euro-American paradigm, is being transformed and renegotiated. So, in fact, values as such are are things which are now receiving a a new, uh, if you if you want to to, to put it. Uh, in, a, in a funny way, a kind of new chronology, uh, a new set of, um, of, uh, of kind of uh, lineages uh, which each of these states is trying to create. But I'd like, in a way, I mean, I like, I'm sorry to turn the tables on you. you know, I think you, uh, you were a, pr a, a practitioner in many ways of what was going on in this formulation in Europe during the 1990s. I mean, you were present uh, both from the Indian side as well as the London side in uh, what happened during this particular period. And so you know the Europeans on the other side of the fence um, from literally the ring side. I mean, you were watching the way in which the Commonwealth actually operated when you were handling the, the Secretariat's business there. And you were dealing with a, a number of British issues as Britain as one of the trendsetters within the, the new order uh, actually dealt with these states. Um, did you not have, I, I, I'd like to ask you this question, did you not have a sense that there was a hegemony that was being asserted in this area uh, as far as Western and Eastern Europe was concerned? And you know, wh as you were writing this book and as you were editing it, um, did you not, as it were, uh, begin to think twice about your own experiences as, as an actor uh, and how far, in fact, even academics had failed, um, uh, as well as actors to, to anticipate the problems that were to come. I mean, was there a kind of illusionary period all around in which everybody conspired together in the 1990s to live in a cocoon in which they would not see the problems that were about to happen? I think, uh, Hari, that if we could anticipate problems which are to come, then the world would be a very different place indeed. 
So that's a very difficult proposition. Uh, yes, I think that um, the, I mean, to, to be very brief uh, and to answer your point, I think that the expansion of the European Union, the continuous expansion that took place from, from the time the Union was declared in Maastricht to, um, you know, the 27 states which it is now, I think uh, created its own difficulties and tensions especially since the absorption of the Eastern Central European states was in a way a forced uh, absorption. They did not really have time to adjust to the mores of uh, the European Union before they were incorporated because the whole um, dogma at that time was to reach out to the former Soviet Union territories. So the um, expansion took place uh, helter-skelter and uh, you can see the problems that take place now in Germany with Eastern Germany. Um, and so I think that um, um, it was not anticipated, but it was probably inevitable. But can I just change the optic now a little bit? Uh, no, I haven't answered your question about academics and practitioners. Well, there's always a difficulty here uh, when uh, practitioners become academics and uh, vice versa. It's a difficulty, particularly in countries like India, where there is a rather formidable gulf between academia and uh, the practitioners. Um, it's much less so, I think, Sugato in USA. Um, firstly, because I think that the bureaucracy is much more open to other ideas from, from outside the bureaucracy. And secondly, because there's a great interchange of personnel. The spoil system in the USA provides for this continuous uh, regeneration, if you like, of the bureaucracy from expertise from outside. I think the Indian government has trifled with this from time to time, but it has not gone... Uh, as far as it should have, and it's gone um, uh, probably less effectively than it should have as well. So that gulf, if you say that, if you can call it suspicion, uh, still continues. But Shugato has been um, the, uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee of uh, the Parliament, and he'd be able to tell us more about that, I'm sure. Because the same, I think, applies, Shugato, to the parliamentarians and the bureaucracy. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I... Uh, I'm an academic uh, um, who uh, uh, had this uh, wonderful uh, anthropological experience uh, of uh, observing uh, Indian politics at, uh, at close quarters for five years. And throughout that half a decade, I served on the Parliamentary Standing Committee on uh, External Affairs. Uh, we did have to grapple with the question of uh, values and uh, interests. Uh, I can give you two examples. Uh, the um, draft uh, constitution amendment bill, which would form the basis of the land boundary agreement with Bangladesh, uh, came to us. And I played a very active role in those discussions and the drafting uh, of, the, of the report. Now, one of the legacies uh, of colonialism is that uh, we in Asia, and particularly in India, uh, seem to have uh, inherited uh, a unitary conception of sovereignty uh, and also uh, the sense that uh, you know, borders have to be strictly drawn. Uh, we have a legacy of uh, an obsession with cartographic anxiety from uh, colonial times. So uh, one of the difficulties uh, that we faced uh, was that um, we were going to notionally lose a few acres of land uh, if uh, this uh, comprehensive land boundary agreement was to be forged. And for 40 years, uh, the Indira Gandhi Sheikh Mujibur Rahman agreement had not been ratified by India's parliament. So uh, I had to make an argument that it is possible uh, to finally balance the national interest, the state's interests, and also I decided to use the phrase the human interest of the poor people living in those enclaves, um, uh, you know, that um, uh, Radcliffe hadn't really dealt with. He was a very bad surgeon when he drew the Radcliffe line in uh, 1947 and left these swabs, um, uh, which uh, continued to you know, f 
fester. Uh, so um, I, I was able to say that, you know, look, it is in our national interest to have good relations with Bangladesh for a whole variety of reasons. Therefore, we should go forward with it. We need to protect the state's interests, especially if there are going to be financial burdens in case there's even a limited uh, movement of, uh, of people. And I still remember telling uh, Sushma Swaraj, who was external affairs minister, that please uh, do not uh, send, with all due apologies to you, Chris, please do not send any bureaucrats uh, to Mamata Banerjee, to the chief minister of Bengal, uh, because that's exactly what happened. A, a very, no, a, a very fine bureaucrat had been sent by Manmohan Singh, Shiv Shankar Menon, but at the very last moment, the day before a visit was going to be made to Bangladesh. And I discussed the matter with Mamata Banerjee, and people were very surprised when I took the position that I did uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee. But I had already discussed it with the Chief Minister. It hadn't been discussed uh, you know, broadly uh, with sort of everyone. So the state's interests were going to be protected uh, in the operative paragraphs. We were going to make absolutely sure that you know, all of the interests of the neighboring states would be taken care of. But we did talk about values that ultimately it makes absolutely no sense to cling um, uh, in a dogmatic way to a Westphalian notion of borders and not do something for desperately poor people who have been suffering uh, ever since uh, independence and partition. So I think values did play a part in finally getting this constitution amendment bill through, and we did it unanimously. We were divided on every other issue, but we were able to pass it unanimously. Chugato, yeah. does your, um, your uh, view on borders apply also to the India-China border? Yes, I made the point that if we are not able to resolve uh, the border issue with Bangladesh, then we don't have a hope in hell of making any progress in our negotiations with China, not to mention Pakistan. So let's at least you know, comprehensively resolve the boundary question with a friendly neighbor, Bangladesh, and that may clear the way towards some real progress with our other bigger uh, and more difficult uh, neighbors. But talking about China, uh, we had many discussions during the Doklam standoff. <laughs> And at that point, I have to say that we had to focus on interests, uh, national security. Uh, we as a committee uh, you know, went to Arunachal Pradesh. We visited Tawang. We went to Nathula. Uh, and uh, we you know, presented a report. And I have to say that the members of the opposition uh, showed great restraint and responsibility during that crisis. Uh, you know, uh, and we you know, let the government uh, deal with this uh, difficult uh, situation. Well, uh, uh, that is certainly the sign of a responsible opposition. Can I just um, uh, you know, switch to another aspect? Uh, values are supposed to be fundamental, long-lasting, perhaps eternal universal. But uh, when we come to Japan, Chugato, and uh, Germany, Hari, uh, you find a very rapid U-turn in values um, as a result of the Second World War. Uh, can you just very briefly tell us how that affected Germany and Chugato, Japan? Can you go ahead first, Chugato? Uh, if you are on the losing side, in a world war, then uh, you have to uh, go through a dramatic uh, alteration in values, you might say. Uh, but uh, it was the reality of the situation which I think led uh, Germany and Japan uh, to take an apologetic stance. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, uh, there were reasons for the victorious powers to have also taken an apologetic stance, which they did not for a very long time. If we are thinking about aggression, if we are, if we are considering war crimes, uh, I think the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, uh, were the you know, greatest crimes committed during the Second World War. 
and the Allies did not hold back in bombing uh, civilian targets uh, uh, during the uh, uh, during the Second World War. But it it took a Barack Obama, and this happened just a few years ago, uh, to go to Hiroshima and at least express some regret, uh, and that again is uh, an example of values playing something of a role uh, in uh, trying to rebalance uh, the United States relationship with Japan and also uh, the whole of, uh, of Asia. Uh, we still don't have an apology uh, for the man-made famine of 1943, uh, for which I think the British colonial state was culpable. Uh, so I think that in some ways it was a forced shift in, uh, in values, um, but uh, that is what, what happens. That's the, that's the relationship between you know, realpolitik and uh, certain changes in value systems. Uh, Harry, if you Can don't I mind, if you don't mind, I, sure. I've been asked to now uh, request the audience for their views um, and questions, and I'd be very happy if you uh, uh, are interested enough to ask some challenging questions to our distinguished panelists. I think there should be there should be a mic somewhere. Yeah, we'll repeat the question. Okay, yeah. uh, just just uh, could you could you say what you want to and then we'll repeat it. Uh, we have seen the current obsession of our country with Pakistan. Now, is it going to be a long-term phenomenon or it's a temporary thing? This is number one. Number two is that uh, we have talked a lot about values uh, that differentiates between different countries. So, is OBOR or One Belt, One Road, CPEC, like that, is that going to be Asia's answer to Western sense of globalization and modernization? I would love to know your answer, sir. Thank you. Uh, Hari, would you like to pick that up, please? That gives me an opportunity, really, to take up some issues over here. Um, I think on the Pakistan, uh, both uh, Mr. Srinivasan and Shugota will give you a, uh, a, a better answer than I would. I would I'd just quickly, though, say that uh, sometimes uh, Pakistan is a notion, which is that since you don't want, I mean, it is easier to, to take a small country and and to make it uh, the, the focus of your attention in order to assert your sovereignty and nationalism, rather than take up a, a, a large country which, is, uh, which has greater substance, which hangs at the, at the back of Pakistan anyway. So I think um, there are circumstances in which this will not go away. I think this will continuously be uh, somewhere there in the immediate future, as long as sovereignty is an obsession. Uh, with uh, the Indian state and the way in which it projects itself. Regarding Obor, this is something which I, uh, I always find um, rather an interesting um, uh, point to, uh, to kind of remind people about. Uh, there are different levels of projection of uh, Obor by the Chinese state. The PRC, on, on the one hand, um, actually uh, projects Obor as a as an inclusive Asian project. Okay, I mean, and not just Asian, but global in many ways. Except that the uh, fine uh, tuning, as far as say more distant countries and such are concerned, is, is so much the less. But if you actually look at the core documents that are generated within the Academy of Sciences of the of the Communist Party. Uh, and uh, uh, the debates which take place within the Communist Party uh, of China, you will actually see that it's essentially an invitation to the world to learn from China. So that, in fact, this is not inclusive in the sense of everybody is simply going to benefit from the money that we are laying out. But everybody is required also to appreciate the way in which we are doing the laying out of the money, and where that 
perspective has originated in terms of Chinese civilization, culture, and development. So China's path is, in fact, uh, there is a document on China's path and China's path for the world, which nobody reads, okay? And which Mr. Xi Jinping does not particularly uh, project very far. But it is a very, very powerful aspect of the People's Republic's own self-awareness of the way in which it will persuade its own populations to participate in this, uh, this entire venture. And it is something that has to be remembered as a core component of Obor. In fact, within the framework of our book, this aspect of China's modern national globalization is something which is frequently understated and underattended. Okay. Uh, very uh, uh, quickly, uh, we should get over the obsession with Pakistan. Uh, India has legitimate ambitions to play a role on the global stage, and we ought not to be hobbled uh, with uh, differences uh, with our neighbor, there should be a concerted effort to resolve matters so that we can play the global role that we aspire to. On Obor, obviously, India has uh, uh, certain objections uh, based on the sovereignty issue, and that's because one part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, will be going through uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. But India also, I think, uh, is committed uh, to building greater connectivity across uh, Asia and the Indian Ocean. And therefore, I think we can come to some kind of an uh, understanding among different Asian uh, countries. Uh, of course, India will focus on relations with Southeast Asia and Japan, and even link up with Japan to establish uh, relationships with, uh, with Africa. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to make one other statement that there are certain occasions on which a country can assert values. And uh, I must say that I'm utterly dismayed that on the 70th anniversary of the Indian Republic, our government and our Prime Minister Narendra Modi has chosen to invite Brazil's Bolsonaro. I know something about Bolsonaro. I always discuss uh, Brazilian politics and Indian politics and American politics with my Brazilian colleague in the history department at Harvard, Sidney Shalhoub, and also, of course, with my American colleagues. Here is someone who is a patron of death squads in Brazil. And we had so much choice. This is a world with so many different sovereign countries. And we could not have invited someone with a sense of values on the 70th anniversary of independence uh, of, of the republic. I can understand that we have economic interests to protect with Brazil. But that can easily be done through bilateral meetings. That can easily be achieved at BRICS meetings on a ceremonial occasion, such as the 70th anniversary of the Republic, we ought to have done better, unless it is our objective to show that India is simply part of the global rise of right-wing authoritarianisms. Thank you. So the United States is losing its role as a global leader on the world stage. So do you think its successor will be able to restore that? Uh, you're speaking of Mr. Trump, perhaps, are you? Yeah, yeah he, he created well, a big deal. I think that um, you know, this is a very speculative question because uh, it depends on how long one has to wait for a successor of a different mold. Because uh, I asked uh, Shugato earlier about uh, the Trump legacy and um, uh, I personally do not know, and I don't think anyone knows, whether Trump has laid down certain markers that are actually going to continue for much longer than Mr. Trump's presidency, whether it's for another four years or, or whether it is just for another few months. Uh, because I think uh, the Trumpism, if you like, in America, I don't think you disagree with this, has a constituency 
uh, of, uh, of a significant number uh, of persons in the USA. He has tapped into a certain mood in the USA, um, which uh, may continue for really quite some time post-Trumpism. And if that continues, I think it will constitute a different kind of USA altogether. And I think that, as Shugato said, in that case, I think uh, they will inevitably decline in terms of world leadership. Do you have a mic? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I had to ask one thing, actually. Does the Trump administration's foreign policy just like reflect a bit of George Bush, actually, that you are that you are either with with them or with George us? George W. Bush. Yeah, George W. Bush, actually. Uh, and actually, the the uh, way the uh, Iran deal was just left by the USA, despite despite all the partners saying saying to stay, and the way the Paris Climate Agreement was also just torn up and like thrown and the, the U.S. just left it in 2017. I think so we've actually really discussed that already, and mm -hmm. uh, I, think you, I think that answer has been given, mm -hmm. that um, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, Shugato, if I may yeah. it, use your words, uh, he wanted really to overturn his democratic predecessor's policies in every possible respect, whether it's climate change or whether it's Iran. Uh, have I got that right? Uh, yes, and I would say Donald Trump has gone much further than, than uh, George, uh, George W. Bush. And I think we've answered uh, that question. And also, I think uh, it's touch and go in the US elections of 2020, because there is about one third of the US electorate that is uh, solidly uh, behind Donald Trump. And uh, as we have seen in our own country, a second term uh, for a democratically elected authoritarian leader can pose much graver dangers than in the first term. You, you um, have the last word. <laughs> no, you do, because you're <laughs> going to answer the question. I no, will th try. Thank you. you. Thank you. This is delightful. This is Ambassador Bhagwati. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, an author who is going to present his book at the at this literary meet at, at five o'clock today in the evening. You know, I'm kind of looking back, uh, and I remember uh, one foreign secretary, not for ex foreign secretary Shinivas, and some other foreign Indian foreign secretary. We were chatting, uh, and I think the Russian president, uh, President Putin, was going to come to Delhi, and we were at the airport to receive him, and. There's still some time. So we started talking about values. And he remarked to me that Germany, uh, values we push at multilateral forums. When it comes to core, hardcore national interests, it's all done bilaterally. Now, I would like a comment on that. But when I look around the world and look at what you mentioned, the bombing of Hiroshima and so on, I'm not entirely sure whether uh, less, should we say, to the right president would have done this or a less, in the US context, a, a president who was uh, more towards the left. We know that Lyndon B. Johnson was a Democratic president, accidental one, after JFK was killed. And he's the one who actually ordered that particular landing on that particular beach in Vietnam. So. To some extent, I have sympathy with this thing that it's governments always tend to act with regard to interests. And I'll now pose my question. Is it civil society and intellectuals, people like you, who then somehow modify or dilute governments which have armies at their disposal, intelligence agencies at their disposal, who are constantly interacting with the political leadership to pursue national interests to the hilt but it is the rest of the country, and therefore, first uh, condition is that it has to be a democratic country. Otherwise, you know, in dictatorships, civil society in Hitler's Germany couldn't Thank have you. done much. Thank you. Well, uh, governments uh, have power, which they typically wield. I just wish that uh, public intellectuals and civil society had more influence on the behavior of, uh, of governments. 
Yeah, I you know I I would like to uh, to to take this up with with a slight uh, twist. Um, I think, in fact, actually, uh, just reflecting on on Mr. Trump very quickly, uh, the distinction between him and a a Bush is that somewhere or another, a Bush is an extension of a value system, and there is a, a kind of uh, neoconservatism um, which is which was present under the Bush presidency, which is an extension somewhere of, of things which uh, were there in the 1990s in the global presence of the United States. Mr. Trump is something else. Mr. Trump is, is a maverick, but there are many mavericks in this pack at the moment. And I think this is very important for all of you to remember, which is that when, uh, and I think Weber uh, put it very well, I mean, ultimately when people have no faith in all the things they're meant to have faith in, they suddenly turn to a person, a person who somewhere seems to indicate all the, the mood, the ideas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which they would like to stand by, but they have no words to actually develop and, uh, and, and kind of find an epitome for. And I think really, when you're dealing with international politics today, somewhere the accident of the 1990s, which actually place the United States at the center of everything, is now being undone. And people are looking for something else. But unless, and this I think is where Shukuta is right, unless, especially in Asia, we begin to assert our alternative senses of how this modern democracy that we have built on our own terms is able to project itself with all its variety you will simply have a degeneration into worse and worse scenarios of the present, where people are struggling to find alternatives in this world. Somewhere or another, a sense of both language and of a discourse, even if a coherent philosophy is absent, is something that we must work our way towards. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your patience and for your attention. I'd like you to give a hand, good big hand, please, to Professor Vasudevan, Professor Bose.